which is the candidates panel for supervisory district number three. I'm sure you all know that Don Horsley uh, has termed out, and so we have an opportunity to have wholly different representation. So I'm just going to at first uh, do a quick uh, lineup in alphabetical order. So that would be Stephen Booker. <laughs> and, uh, Virginia Chang Karali. Ray Mueller. And Laura Palmer Lohan. Now, cards were made available at the sign-in table, or if you need a card, there's uh, index cards on each uh, dining room table. Um, Connie here is going to be sorting the questions for me and so that we don't have a lot of duplicate questions. Um, and the process will be that each candidate will have an opportunity to have three minutes to introduce themselves and where they want to go. And uh, then we'll have two minutes per question and then a little wind-up of two minutes each at the end. Jim Heldberg is going to act as our timekeeper. He's back there in the corner again, and he has some uh, cards that show you how far along you are. So green shows that you have two minutes left. Uh, yellow shows that you have 30 seconds left. And red shows that your time is up. One minute. Why don't you do one minute? One minute for that. And Okay. The one uh, sad little thing here is that although there are many microphones in this room, most of them do not work. <laughs> so I have a, m a microphone for the candidates that um, you're going to have to pass between you. I hope that's not too collegial uh, or anything. So um, let's see. Um, so I'll, we'll start um, opening statements in which you should introduce yourself and what you think you can do for us. And I'm going to start down here at the far end with Laura. Uh, good morning, Pacifica. <laughs> thank you so much for coming out this morning. I want to thank the Pacifica uh, Democratic Club for this event, uh, uh, PT, uh, PT, PCT, <laughs> um, as well, uh, Mary Ann uh, uh, Plum and Jim Helpring for your support today. My name is Laura Palmer Lohan, and it is a privilege and an honor uh, to be on this journey with all of you. Um, my intention is to um, serve your community uh, to, to your satisfaction. I know that there's a lot of issues uh, here in Pacifico that I'll get to in a moment, but just by way of background, um, I currently serve on city council in the city of San Carlos, last year as mayor. Um, I am a working mom. I have two beautiful boys, um, and um, I'm, I uh, am a small business owner. I've been a lifelong Democrat, and I'm proud to say I have voted in every single election uh, since I was eligible at the age of 18. Right, so civic engagement really is important to me. My leadership will bring people together to address uh, all of that which is we are most concerned about. And I recognize uh, that many people are concerned about the drought, especially in this community sea level rise and the seawall repair project, as well as uh, the pier and the uh, sewage outflow is uh, compromised in this community. Um, as well, uh, we have wildfires uh, that are uh, causing our um, housing costs to go up because we, we uh, can't afford the insurance or our insurance is getting cut off. As well, um, uh, it's just not safe, obviously. So fire prevention is really important. Um, I really appreciate the amazing uh, commitment this community has uh, to the environment. Uh, the work that Lynn Adams does with Pacifica Beach Coalition is something I wholly support, and I'm, I'm really appreciative of her community-oriented approach that she takes. Um, housing is also another area of concern. We need to make sure that the people who, who live and, and work in our communities can afford to live here. And I'm, I'm uh, willing to do that in a way that doesn't compromise uh, uh, further traffic exacerbations in our community, because I know that's also an issue in Pacifica. As a board member for Peninsula Clean Energy, I've advocated for funding to uh, electrify uh, our energy resources and invest in EV uh, technology and infrastructure so we can get those electric vehicles charged on a regular basis and work with homeowners to bring the cost down of converting to electrification. Um, 
Um, I also am concerned about homelessness. Uh, it has nearly doubled in our county since the pandemic began. I was pleased to be at the uh, groundbreaking at the Navigation Center in Redwood City with my endorser, Don Horsley, whose seat um, I will be taking over hopefully in November with your support. Um, Carol Groom and D Don's last two uh, predecessors, Rich Gordon and Ted Lempert. They know this work, uh, they know me, and they believe I'm best suited for this role. My hope today is to earn your support as well for, for the election in June. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. I should mention, which I forgot to do at the beginning, that we are being um, broadcast by Pacific Coast Television today. So that's why we're all focused on the microphone so they can hear us. <laughs> and that's Jason, that's Jason back in the back. <laughs> so, Thank you, Laura. Um, let's go next to uh, Virginia Chang Corrali. Thank you. Good morning, Pacifica. And it's great to be back in Sharp Park on this beautiful, bright, sunny day, right? <laughs> Uh, this is like Pacifica's weather, and it's really beautiful. Actually, I was here yesterday, and I can't believe the night and day. It was beautiful yesterday, too. Uh, many thanks to the Pacifica Daily City Democrats for organizing this forum and for allowing us to speak as to why uh, we should all be your next supervisor. I'm a Virginia Chain Corrali, and I'm running to be your next supervisor. As a resident of the unincorporated areas West Menlo Park, I've had the privilege of serving in two elected office simultaneously. One is the San Mateo County Harbor District Board, and the other is the Menlo Park Fire Protection District Board. I am a daughter of Chinese immigrants, uh, parents who fled communist China to have a better life. So uh, I know what freedom is, and I appreciate freedom because it has given my family and me a better life and actually has affected future generations like my son and hopefully their kids in the future. Uh, as to why this is the best place to live. I earned my bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin in government and with a minor in economics, and I earned my Master of Public Administration at the University of Southern California. I grew up in Austin, Texas. Since my dad was in academia, uh, we have always been uh, enlightened and always um, tried to instill the values of independent thinking. So questioning and finding the best outcomes has been in my DNA for a long time, and it's something that I've instilled in my children. My professional background has been in financial, uh, financial management, investments, and business, so I bring that skill to both of the boards that I'm on, fiscal accountability, transparency. Uh, I think in this day and age, you know, we have to be more accountable, especially since uh, inflation is at a 40-year high in gas prices and the cost of goods continue to increase. So everything that I do is underlined by the fiscal part of, um, of you know, of the budget and of services. Uh, I think your tax dollars are what should be the biggest uh, priority and it is for me. And it's something that I've always campaigned on and it's the reason I'm in two elected offices. Uh, as an independent thinker, I will bring common sense to tackle our county's most pressing issues. I have fought against waste, tax abuse, and fraud on the San Mateo County Civil Grand Jury, and I've also helped, uh, shared, uh, helped bring shared prosperity to Californians on the California Commission for Economic Development. Uh, as the only candidate serving residents on the coast side and the bay side, I understand the diverse needs of our community and District 3 in particular. I believe government should work for you and not stifle you. And I look forward to answering your questions and speaking with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. And Stephen, go ahead. Good morning, Pacifica. Um, my name is Stephen Booker. Um, for those of you who don't know me, there's a lot of familiar faces in here. but. Um, I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident. I grew up in uh, Daly City. I'm a product of the Jefferson Unified High School District. I went to Panorama, uh, I went to Lipman, I went to Jefferson for a year before I transferred to Reardon. Um, I grew up with parents that were uh, very civically minded. We would uh, go down to my elementary school on election days and, uh, and my parents would talk to other parents while uh, the kids played outside. And it was sort of like a, a little open house or family night. And uh, we would do that every election. And um, I realized the importance of, of being involved civically at a young age. 
Um, as I grew up, I graduated from Reardon, like I said. I joined the United States Air Force because I continue want to serve my country. And uh, I traveled halfway around the world and back. Um, I'm a Desert Storm vet. And um, I realized I didn't want to make the Air Force a, a career, so I came back home. And I was um, a student at the College of San Mateo, and I was going to school to be a, a police officer. I figured I was just got off the military. Police departments are paramilitary groups. It seemed like a natural transition. But in doing so, um, I was carpooling with a friend, and he encouraged me to take the test to become an electrician. It took him about a year. I took that test to become an electrician, and I got accepted. In doing so, I got more and more involved with local politics. I would go to city council meetings to support or oppose legislation or projects that were good for the environment or good for social and economic justice or that we felt was bad for those very reasons. And as I got more and more involved, um, I was offered the position of political director and community affairs liaison, which is my job now. Um, and in doing so, I got, I don't want to say, um, how do I say this? I got bit by the political bug. And I saw that there was, there was definitely a need in our county for uh, underserved communities and for, uh, you know, for workers. And I just wanted to do more to help my county. Like I said, I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident. I believe San Mateo County is a wonderful place to live. Even in this wealthy and well-educated county, I feel that there's too many communities and people that are being left behind. And as an African-American man, I'm running for supervisor to build a more equitable county where everyone has a voice from the coast side to San Carlos to Menlo Park and everywhere in between. Um, thank you for having me here. I look forward to getting to know you guys better and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. And that brings us to Ray Mueller. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm going to go ahead in my introduction, just go ahead and take a moment to introduce myself to you because we're going to have a lot of time talking about issues. My name is Ray Mueller. First and foremost, I'm a dad I have, and a husband. I have a 16-year-old son, a 12-year-old daughter who's about to turn 13, which terrifies me. Uh, we are, uh, my wife is a middle school principal. Oops. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I'll just talk real loud. Oh, it's back on. Okay, my wife is a middle school principal. Uh, she has bragging rights in our house in 2014. He's trying to adjust the volume. Let's pause just a moment. Let's just unscrews the base just unscrews here and, uh, can we blame the rotary club <laughs> sure <laughs> we have two prominent rotary club members here three new, two, no new chairs oh thank you We're in action. We have action. Okay. So I'm going to take a step back and tell you about a little bit about what compels me to be in public service. So when I was when I was young, uh, when I was young, about fourth grade, my dad became disabled. He was a dentist, and I was part of a large family, seven kids. And at that time period, uh, we really, our life changed dramatically. My dad, uh, my dad was basically, could out of, be out of bed three hours a day, uh, and then he'd be on painkillers. My mom had to go to night school, figure out how to support the family. And at that time period, I was uh, old enough to know what was going on, and young enough to have absolutely no, no control. And it really infected me, it affected my siblings. I grew up in a converted uh, garage with two brothers. Our, my, my older siblings got married young. They came. To, they they grew up with us. I like to say their their families came in with us, and it compelled us all to make, want to make the world a better place. And so uh, I ended up going to Cal uh, College of Natural Resources. I like to say I was green before green was cool. My wife. I married my high school sweetheart. My wife was an environmental science major there, and then afterwards I ended up going to Hastings College of the Law. I studied at the, I, I worked at the Public Law Research Institute and then worked, went to work at the Legislative Council's office in Sacramento. 
and really wanted to figure out how do you help people? How do you make a difference? Uh, after that, uh, my last year of law school, I caught, I, I, so I was totally in love with public policy, but my last year of law school, I caught the trial bug, and I spent 10 years litigating, representing working families, representing people who needed help against large corporations. I've sued tobacco companies, I've sued auto manufacturers, anyone who made a product that hurt someone, I fought for them. Uh, and then after that, what happened was 2008, the recession hit, and I felt myself compelled, compelled back to public service. In, uh, long, over a period of volunteering, becoming a, a commissioner, ended up on the Menlo Park City Council. Now I gotta speed up. Uh, so I served, I've served three terms of the Menlo Park City Council, uh, 10 years there. I also am uniquely qualified to be a county supervisor. I've worked for a county supervisor as their chief of staff. So I understand how to move policy through and help people. Uh, I've been endorsed by your entire Pacifica City Council and five other uh, former Pacifica City Council members. Over 60 current and former City Council members in District 3. Over 50 uh, elected women leaders throughout our region. And I'm uh, proud today to say I'm endorsed by the Democratic Party of San Mateo County, Coastside Democrats, the Sierra Club, a number of organizations that you can look up on the website. The that, the I, I share that because the aggregate, aggregate of that means I'm ready today to help people. I'm ready today to be here to help solve problems in Pacifica with you. The first thing I'm going to do as supervisor is put an office on this coast. Because people, people who need help, they don't have time to go to Redwood City. They don't have time to go that far. They need to have the supervisor here to be with them. Looking forward to speaking with you today. Thank you very much. So we're just going through the questions that have been submitted here, and we have a lot of them on climate change. So we'll start with one that's, uh, the Fifth Amendment prohibits taking a private property without compensation. And while the Coastal Commission is not directly taking property, they're using sea level rise to prohibit people from protecting their property and, and getting full use of it. Um, what can the county do to protect homeowners in this situation? We'll first give this question to Virginia. So this like this. Y'all can hear me now, right? Okay. Oh my goodness, you don't want to hear me sing, right? Um, anyway, so I am a firm believer of the, the Fifth Amendment and takings. I think any time your property rights are uh, violated, then you need to have just compensation. I think that um, at the heart of what is happening, especially in Pacifica, is about property rights. And I think that for me, as a member of the Board of Supervisors, I would continue to advocate for your property rights. The Fifth, the Fifth Amendment is sacred to me. The Constitution in general is sacred to me, but the Fifth Amendment in particular, because um, people buy property for investments. I know that for immigrant families, because I my family, is, or it's their immigrant family, it's an immigrant family, we bought property to invest so that it's a nest egg and you can generate income from that. So whether you're buying for your home or for, uh, it, for income generation, property rights are very valuable. And so I support uh, having property rights uh, respected. Thank you very much. And I would point out you're not obligated to use all your time. I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so Stephen Booker, the same question. Um, absolutely, I believe that citizens should rights to maintain their property. I don't, I don't believe in eminent domain and, and uh, basically what's considered a hostile takeover. Like Virginia said, people invest in their properties and it's a source of uh, resources for, for their families to come. And um, I just want to say one more thing before I forget. I'm a father too, and I just want to give a quick shout out to my daughter Jasmine who showed up today. So thank you, thank you for supporting me, Jasmine. But yes, uh, people spend their hard-earned money and their lives to, to do something that's better for their family, to make better lives for their families, and to have an agency come in and just want to take over because of what they believe is, is uh, economic justice, which I'm not saying it isn't, but economic justice is also paying attention and listening to the constituents and the people in the city who are actually dealing with the problem. 
and who, who invested their hard-earned money and their blood, sweat, and tears for these properties. So I definitely agree that I would support you 110% in, in keeping your properties. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, like my colleagues, I do believe in the Fifth Amendment. But I also believe uh, that I, well, and let me just say, my, my intention is to take that Coastal Commission seat as soon as possible as your representative. Uh, I think that actually the supervisor representing this district should be in that seat because I think they're working closely with the residents here. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you, and it's a little off topic, but it, it's the same vein, we obviously need to work to protect our, our sea walls here in Pacifica. But one of the things that we need to do is try to figure out what do we do when we can't, when they can't be maintained anymore, when sea level rise starts to take them. So one of the things that I would propose we do is actually work with our state legislator and work, work with our congresswoman on that issue and try to go ahead and get funding for, when, for, for homeowners for when those walls can't be maintained anymore. So because what we have right now, what's happening right now is we have a situation where we see the impending coming, but we're not preparing to help those in need of when the time comes they need that help. And we need to plan advan in advance for that. One, in, in this race, I've been endorsed by Congresswoman Eshoo. I've been endorsed by all of our state legislators. I know we'll be able to work with them to go ahead and get that plan in place. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Laura. Great, thank you. Um, so the homeowners who live on the coast here are stuck between a rock and a hard place. And that hard place is the rising seawaters and the ocean. Um, this is uh, unconscionable to me that it has been made so difficult for these homeowners. And um, thanks to Judy Taylor, I was schooled on just how complicated these issues are between the many different um, agencies. Um, these homes are people's homes. It's where they live. Um, they're not able to, to remodel them or upgrade them because of the complications um, associated with all of the regulations. Uh, we need to dig in and untie this knot. Um, as your representative at the county level, I, you have my commitment that I'm going to lean into this and help property owners maintain their wealth and more importantly their homes. And we'll do that by working together. Um, you know, that's not their fault <laughs> that the climate has changed, and um, we we have we see the devastating impacts. Right, riprap is all along uh, that particular area. Um, I was living in the Sunset District when those apartment um, but those apartments fell into um, the water, and we have to keep people safe and we have to keep them housed. So you have my commitment that I'll work with you. Um, I have close working relationships with the state legislatures as well as the Congress people. Um, it, endorsements, uh, that's great, uh, but it's being able to have that collaborative relationship that truly matters. And um, I'm, I'm your person uh, for this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, for our next question, we'll be also sticking to the um, uh, topic of climate change. Um, what are the major sources of greenhouse gas emissions in San Mateo County? Um, what are the top two? And uh, what would you do to get these biggest and next biggest uh, emitters to get to net zero? And we'll start with Stephen Booker. So I'm on the Citizens Advisory Committee for Peninsula Clean Energy. And one of the things that we do is um, try to advance reach codes throughout cities to prevent uh, greenhouse gases. Um, we also have legislators that are trying to ban or that are banning um, generators and small like leaf blowers and lawnmowers to, to, because they, they're mass producers of greenhouse gas. Um, I'm definitely in support of that. We got to have renewable sustainable energy that's green, new technologies, and we have to do it with a skilled and trained workforce that we can keep young individuals that aren't going to go to four-year colleges where they can make a sustainable living to continue to live in our, in our county and have um, green energy so we reduce greenhouse gases. We also need to have um, more electric vehicles and more electric vehicle charging stations and that's something that as, a, as an electrician that we uh, put our apprentices through. We have electrical vehicle charging stations in our training center and we promote uh, green energy through and through. So I believe that we need to continue to do that and stop using natural gases and, and get off um, get, get off our, uh, stop using uh, petroleum and gas vehicles as, as much as we possibly can. So thank you. Thank you. And Ray Mueller. Thank you. 
So this is something I'm passionate about. As a Menlo Park City Council member, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the country to pass REACH codes, which limited the use of gas in a new construction. And uh, basically, we have two, two CO2 emitters in the, in the county. We have, we have infrastructure like homes and, and, and industrial that's using gas appliances. And then we also have gas-powered vehicles. Now, for existing infrastructure, we need help from the state legislature and the federal government because it can be very expensive to go ahead and change uh, existing infrastructure. And that's very, like, we, we, that just disproportionately affects people on fixed incomes and frankly, just families who are just trying to make it paycheck make their paycheck last. Now, recently I wrote an editorial talking about economic green uh, opportunity zones, which would go ahead and basically pilot opportunity zones with the state to bring in rebates, uh, um, tax breaks, a whole list of, uh, of, of incentives to help people be able to do this. And I just actually was able to have a conversation, uh, email exchange with the head of the US Department of Energy uh, the administrator of that, who saw the editorial and was excited about that. In Menlo Park, we just recently brought in an entity called Block Power, which is a nonprofit. We're getting state funding for that to go ahead and help individual homeowners make that conversion. With respect, who want to make that conversion? And let me be very clear. I really believe with that needs to be this needs to be done with a carrot approach because every person is in a different economic circumstance. Now, the second gas-powered vehicles is uh, you know, that's going to be required by the state soon that you're not going to be able to buy a, a gas-powered vehicle. But what really matters there is infrastructure planning, the private infrastructure of actually putting in place chargers where we have gas, where we have gasoline stations, where we have working to go ahead and make sure we have chargers for people who are living in apartment buildings. There is a whole bunch of work that has to be done now, frankly, to do that because it's intensive and pe inexpensive and we need to work with our utilities and force them to actually get that work done. Thank you very much. Thank you, and Laura Palmer. Thank you, Laura Palmer Lohan. Um, so I actually um, am on the board of directors for Peninsula Clean Energy, and I sit on their steering committee and um, help build the strategy and the plan for how we're actually gonna move um, to 24-7 uh, co-committant uh, clean energy delivery by 2025. So I just wanna pause there for a second. So by the year 2025, Peninsula Clean Energy, who delivers energy to your home right now, is committed to making sure that that energy is clean. We're investing in solar projects that come with storage, because solar doesn't work when the sun isn't up. Um, in addition, 10% um, of all cars purchased in San Mateo County two years ago were electric vehicles. The biggest frustration that people have in the community right now is the lack of uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We are actually today investing dollars into building that out. Our goal is to have 6,200 uh, electric vehicle chargers um, in three years' time. It's a steep curve, uh, but I believe we can do it, and more is actually um, going to be needed, and I think the county can help with this. Um, in addition, uh, we can put some of those at uh, local shopping districts. So we know the mom and pop shops have been hurt desperately uh, by online ordering, and this could help drive people down to those local shopping centers so they can support our local restaurants, uh, bars, and uh, in addition, um, I also push for carbon neutrality for by the year 2035, 10 years uh, than we're required to do so, because I don't want to kick this down the can. I have two boys that have already informed me that my generation hasn't done right by them. So we're looking at carbon neutrality by the year 2035, and I was a big proponent of this. Um, so I look forward to working with you to make these changes to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in our community, both with transportation and buildings and more. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Virginia. Thank you, it's a very important question. Um, the two sources of greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions, I believe, are cars, uh, vehicles in general, gas emission, gas emitting vehicles in industrial buildings. But, uh, and so we, you've heard what everyone else has said, and I, and I agree, uh, but let me just tell you one of the things that I think is really important, because it's something that I've worked on as a fire board member of the Menlo Park Fire Protection District. Um, when I was board president in 2019, the fire district actually wanted to purchase an electric fire truck. And we test drove it, it came out of Europe, and it was fantastic. And so hopefully we'll be able to get that going. It hasn't happened yet, not because of me, but because you know I think the rest of the board wasn't ready. So we lost barely on that vote. But the main thing is that government has 
a leading role in making sure that we've got the infrastructure in place and that we have transitions that can happen without compromising safety of residents. When Menlo Park instituted these REACH codes in 2019, what I felt that was lacking was the lack of, was col no collaboration with the fire district when we were building our new downtown fire station, which actually ha is one of our busiest stations and down that goes to downtown, to Menlo College, and many schools along Valparaiso. So as we transition to um, electrification, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to fund infrastructure, not just at the individual and business levels, but at the government levels as well, because I think government has to actually be the leader on this. Thank you very much. Okay. So for our next question, we were going to segue a little bit to uh, homelessness and housing. Um, the county is closing on its purchase of its fifth hotel, um, which is one way of housing the homeless. Uh, that does have ramifications because of loss of tax revenue. Uh, additionally, a lot of this has happened in places other than Pacifica. Uh, we have a significant issue with uh, homeless folks living in um, uh, RVs and, and cars and so forth. So what can the county do to help Pacifica get in on this while at the same time not damaging the revenue stream for both the county and the city? And I believe that's uh, Ray's turn. Well, I think it's important to understand that homelessness is a holistic issue. It, it, it takes into account health care, takes into account mental health, takes into, there are, there are uh, many a myriad of wraparound services that you need to go ahead and provide to actually help people get off the street and so I've I actually worked on the board of life moves uh, which is one of the largest homeless services provider in San, San Mateo and Santa Clara County I also was appointed by the president of the state assembly to serve on the Ca on the California tax credit allocation committee to actually help build affordable housing to represent all cities in the state on that committee. And so what I can tell you is housing, uh, affordable, uh, excuse me, homelessness is, is uh, not an easy issue because you have to deal, you have workforce homeless, you have people who are acutely homeless, for instance, in domestic violence situations, and then you have uh, your chronic homeless. For our chronic homeless, which is really, uh, which is a tremendous issue, we ha really have to go ahead and we have to actually bring more county resources to mental health. Uh, right now what happens is so many of our, our chronically homeless are really left to the street and then we have social workers who are being sent out to be with them uh, who just are completely under-resourced and the only tool they have to help them really is a 5150 hold and most don't qualify it for it. And so we really need to go ahead and actually bring addiction services and bring a, a whole myriad of services to them and treat, and we've, we've tried, we've done, in Menlo Park we were successful in bringing services, we cleared out an entire area out in the bay that for a long time uh, was, we, we had a many chronic homeless living in. We were able to go ahead and bring that count down uh, to about, uh, I think to about three, but it actually required, required help with, cal it's also multi-jurisdictional. We had to have most homeless, uh, chronic, chronically homeless, live in areas that are owned by the state, and, or they live in county areas, correct, frankly, and so you need help from the state agency to actually help bring those services and to move them into care. Uh, with respect to workforce, workforce homeless, excuse me, or to those who are acutely homeless, it really is a question of actually building those services out, finding county land available and actually, or, or buying county land, or buying, which what we're doing, what the county is doing now. And then we see that happening with the Opportunity Center right now in Redwood City, which is a tremendous opportunity to go ahead and bring people to that. Uh, and, and provide them, again, services. What you have happening right now in Pacifica, and I'm just about out of time, is really interesting with respect to the fact that you're really trying to provide safe spaces for people to go ahead and bring who, your workforce, your workforce homeless, to go ahead and put their RVs. And it really is about finding the proper location, but then doing the background checks on everyone who's there to build trust in the community so people understand these are just people who are just trying to find some place to live, who need to, need to do so with dignity. And then making sure that you have wraparound services there to help them. You have the ability to help them uh, provide all the services, for instance, that a provider like Life Moves can with a contract with, and I'm out of time. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Laura Palmer Lohan, it's your turn. Thank you, really important question. Um, 
I sit on the steering committee for Home for All, with, which is a county-sponsored uh, program, uh, the purpose of which is to provide um, a, a situation analysis of where we are at any given time with respect to um, house, our housing situation in the county, um, as well as to work across stakeholder groups in a collaborative way uh, to uh, build uh, community awareness of what's needed um, and uh, move together in policy uh, creation and sharing of best practices. Um, so I can, will continue to support and invest in this particular program because it's been a tremendous resource. The city of San Carlos went from a community uh, when I was running for office of asking for moratorium on housing to now it's the second most requested need um, unsolicited um, in our most recent survey. And that's because I leaned into the community. I was willing to hear their concerns. It is a controversial issue. Not everybody wants a homeless, a homeless center next to them. However, we are in the process right now of converting two. Um, we just actually completed a, a six unit uh, conversion to 23 units right in the middle of downtown, all at the lower levels of, um, of uh, affordability, using city funds um, and matching that with county grants. And it will serve people at the very lowest of incomes. So we need to continue to work through that. I was at the groundbreaking yesterday for the Navigation Center uh, this past week. I met with Aubrey um, Merriman, who is the CEO of Life Moves, and he assured me that he's ready to scale this program. Um, they're able to go from groundbreaking to uh, build out that facility uh, within the year, and it will be open and, and serve 240 people in the county. Um, I think we can take this model in other places, um, as well as open up county lands uh, to support that. Um, as well, uh, wraparound services are really important in addressing what the drivers are associated with homelessness. One is the high cost of housing, and as my opponent pointed out, obviously, uh, the health issues and when people are in crisis, we need to make sure people get the treatments that they need in order to, to remain uh, self-sustaining. So you have my commitment, this is a, a key priority, and I have demonstrated track record with success in this area. Thank you. Thank you. And Virginia. Thank you for the very important question on a very important topic. So there, to me, there are two types of homelessness, work, the working homeless and the street homeless. And the working homeless, um, I think, require more services, but also they require a place to go. And during the CZ Lightning Fire, the Harbor District actually opened up its parking lot for evacuees coming in from Pescadero, or coming up from Pescadero. And um, I was wondering at that time, well, you know, can, what can we do? I mean, you had so many people who didn't have homes at that time because they didn't have a choice. But at least some of them had RVs and they were able to find a safe haven within um, the Harbor District and on our property. So those services, or that, that, that type of uh, land should be available. That kind of collaboration with special districts such as the Harbor District or any other agency that has property that could be accessible should be opened. Uh, then you have the, um, the street homelessness, which I think is a bigger problem because no one wants to see them, uh, no one wants them around, but at the same time, they're the ones who need m the most help. And a lot of them suffer from mental illness. I'm the board president of NAMI San Mateo County, and we see this all the time, not just with those who are suffering with, from mental illness, but their families as well, and they need the support. Um, I hate to say this, but tough love is going to be important for street homelessness. And tough love means being able to provide services for addiction and substance abuse. And we, while we have that, we also, you know, we, we could use more. Um, there are also facilities like Serenity House or Serenity Home that, you know, probably could use more support. This kind of facility is used for uh, those who need help right before they become 5150 uh, by law enforcement. And if those resources are taken away or not supported, then you'll have um, more problems with mental illness and, and homelessness as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Stephen. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, as many of you know, I live in Half Moon Bay, and we just recently had um, one of our hotels converted into a homeless shelter which has um, worked out very well. There was a little bit of uproar in the, in the community because they didn't know who was gonna be there and was concerned about criminal records or whatever. But it, it's worked out really good. Um, and I can, we need to continue to do things like uh, Project Home Key and to serve our homelessness. We need to invest more funds for, like my colleagues or my opponents have said, I feel like you're my colleagues, I see you guys so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we need to have uh, more funding 
for, for mental health issues, uh, for our homelessness, for drug addiction, and, and we also need to invest in, in more affordable housing. We live, on, we live in District 3, which is very, very diverse. We have uh, millionaires and, and individuals that are, have home insecurities and food insecurities. We need to build housing for our farm workers. We need to build housing for our essential workers, like our teachers and our nurses. We need to have workforce housing. And we need to have wraparound services for those individuals with mental health issues and with drug addiction problems. And we need to do that with dignity and let them know that we're, that we're a community that cares about everyone. I want to make this a county that's equitable for everyone in the county, not just for those who are uh, secure in their jobs and secure in their housing. Like I said, there's a lot of individuals in San Mateo County, and all they just need is a hand and, and some dignity and some support. And as a supervisor, you will definitely get that from me. Like I said, I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident. I've been halfway around the world and back. I believe this is the best county in California, if not the best county in the United States. I believe we can make it better, and um, I hope to do that with your help. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next question uh, really has to do with um, civility. Um, we have a big problem with social media all over the U.S., <laughs> but next door here in Pacifica is a particular locus of somewhat unpleasant uh, uh, interactions, and... Um, so what, what could the county do to try and inspire engagement and solution-focused pass forward rather than simply hurling rocks at each other? Inspire civility. And let's start with Laura. Great, thank you. So um, this touches on uh, one of the reasons besides the environment that I decided to run for office in the first place. Um, several years ago, my, uh, my youngest son, uh, who was then 12, and now he's uh, 18 and about to head off to college, um, but I'm okay with the empty nest thing, I really am. Um, uh, he uh, approached me um, after a, a presidential election in which the social media um, and all of its ills was front and center. Um, and he told me under no uncertain terms that he was very disappointed with uh, how adults were behaving at the national level and uh, also very concerned about the environment. So two things came out of that. One was he's now the environmental steward of our home and injects uh, ideas about how we can have a more sustainable way of living and he's gonna be pursuing environmental energy at UC Davis in the fall. I'm so, so proud of him. <laughs> um, the other thing that came out of it was I decided to run for office because I wanted to lend my leadership skills to my community because I see firsthand how civil discourse is no longer. Um, we need to lean in and have productive conversations and do so in a way with mutual respect. And the model that I use, and this is how we got housing from you know, persona not grata in San Carlos to now we're gonna exceed our arena goals, um, our housing allocation goals in the next cycle with community support behind it, was because we sat down and talked to each other. There was a community on the east side where they were completely upset, um, threatened to have their emails cut off. I went into that uh, community, I knew how upset they were because they didn't feel listened or heard by their representatives. And today, we have a great relationship. And in fact, um, now, you know, they ask me how my family is instead of yelling at me. And it's because I was willing to sit down at the table and hear their concerns and their feelings. Negative feelings are difficult to deal with, but what's behind those negative and bad feelings is typically a need. We need to be patient and pause for one another and really try to understand what is it that somebody's asking you for? And as your public servant, I commit to you that I will help you lead a better and more productive life and through conversation. That's how we'll get it done. Thank you. Thank you. And Virginia. Civility is so important um, for many reasons, and I think I probably, as you probably, some of you know, have been on the receiving end of not uh, of an incivility, if you will. Um, but I think really what we need to remember is that what we do as public servants and community leaders is getting the business done, getting the people's business done. That's what taxpayers should expect, and that's what tax taxpayers deserve. Uh, at the same time, we have to be able to feel free to voice our differences. Diversity of thought, I think, is completely lacking for both parties, actually. This is, thank goodness, a nonpartisan race so that we can um, actually have civil discourse if needed. But at the same time, I've, what I've seen and what my experience has been uh, is that what you don't want are the lies, the misinformation, 
know, all the things that get in the way of actually doing the people's business. And I've experienced that on the Harbor Board in particular, as some of you have probably read. And um, we got through it because we knew that being ethical and having a high level of integrity are so important to government and that people deserve that kind of level of honesty and transparency and accountability. And tho those things actually prevent um, government from doing its best job for the people. I also think that with diversity of thought, you'll get the best outcome possible. Five members of a city council or a fire board or a harbor board, you know, you, we, it's, it's like an arranged marriage. You don't really have a choice. But what you do have a choice in is working together. And that's what we've tried to do on the harbor board. And we've accomplished that from um, fixing the coastal trail at Mavericks Beach uh, to taking a position on uh, no new offshore drilling to installing those life safety buoys so when that little boy got swept out to sea at Cal Ranch Beach, I think Pacifica has just approved 16 of those. So I'm very proud that under my presidency on the Harbor Board, we were able to accomplish these things. For me, public safety was very important, and I'm glad that the city of Pacifica is following suit so that we'll keep ocean safety a high priority. Thank you very much. And Stephen. Yes, thank you for the question. This won't take long at all. Civility. Um, I believe you have to lead by example. We have to agree to disagree without being disagreeable. Like I said, San Mateo County, California, the Bay Area, it's a very diverse place, uh, one of the most diverse places in the world. And we're not always going to disagree. But we can have those conversations with each other. I have conversations with Virginia and Laura. I have conversations with Ray about policies and issues that go on in Menlo Park or San Carlos when I go to those city council meetings. We don't always agree. but we are never rude. So I believe that leading by example is, is how you do that. And then you have to meet people where they are. You have to be able to say, what's the issue? And have, have, a, have ears and listen and take constructive criticism, not taking it personal. Um, we volunteered for this. We volunteered to be public servants. Um, we're not always going to hear what we want to hear, but that's part of the job. And like I said earlier, lead by example, and that's the best way I, I believe that you can uh, keep civility on social media. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen and Ray. Yeah. So uh, I think a lot. So I used to give a presentation on this one uh, for uh, Green Foothills, and I think the most important thing to understand is when people get involved at the local level, they're not coming to say you're doing a good job. Uh, so people have a life and, when they're, and they're busy with their kids and they're working and so they're coming only time you see someone is when their fight or flight is engaged when something has threatened they think has threatened their home or their kids or something in that circumstance and what we know from psychology is that when someone's fight or flight is engaged their frontal cortex is not working because it's not programmed to work it's not programmed to listen to anybody else it's programmed to fight or defend and so as a as a policymaker and realize that what I learned to do is not take personally when someone comes to me in that circumstance. What I need to try to do actually is work with them and try to get their empathy neurons working so I can get that frontal cortex back on so we can have a conversation. And the way you do that is you create forums. You create, and what I, always tell, what I always tell advocates is the best way to go ahead and get your point across is not to come yell at me, but to tell me your stories. When people tell stories, they actually relate to one another and they can start to actually, you can start to get people reasonableness and we can talk about building policy. And so you need to create those stories. I've done that in, I've done that in Menlo Park and that's how we've able, been able to build housing in our corridors. We've been actually able to, to, to actually do reach codes. We've done things that people would be typically pretty fired up about, but we're able to overcome that by actually working on empathy and creating forms for people to talk. The other smart thing to do is create culturally competent communication. Meet people where they are, like Steven said, so that you can build trust, because you can't get empathy working if people don't trust you to begin with. So you have to communicate with them in the style that they would normally communicate with a peer. Uh, the other, uh, <laughs> lots of the, <laughs> it's okay. The other thing I'd like to say is you need to promote people for public office who have those skills, who are, you know, you can always tell someone when they're running for public office in the style that they run for public office, 
whether or not they're going to be able to do that. Sometimes people run negative campaigns or they feel the need to, prom or to get to a, a negative base level. What you need to do is actually look and promote. So I see Tiger here. Tiger is a great example. You have a, so you have a wonderful city council, all tremendous hearts. Yeah, give them a round of applause. And, and, and so I look at I, and I see them here, and there's such, there's such empathy and discussion with them. And that's so you need to promote people like that to be on your city council so that when, you're, when I'm at the county, hopefully, or, or one of us is blessed to be there, they have a partner who is empathetic, who is building trust in the community, so you're moving the community forward toward that place. And that's really what it's about. At the end of the day, what I like to say is public service isn't just about representation. It's about relationships. That's one of the reasons why I want to have the office on the coast. It's about relationships and that community trust. Thank you. Thanks very much. So for our next question, we're going to shift over to a, a local scandal here in San Mateo County. Uh, there's the PPE scandal, where a lot of uh, equipment and supplies were left outside and ultimately destroyed. Uh, first, I guess, do you know how this happened, and what would you do to prevent this and other things of this nature from happening in the future? We'll start with Virginia. Thank you for that question. This PPE scandal is, um, <laughs> I, I, just, I couldn't believe it. As a former member of the civil grand jury and a, and a four person, former four person of the civil grand jury, I was shocked, angry, frustrated. Uh, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I understand that this is what I have heard. You really can't understand the full picture until you talk to the parties, is that um, there was an event that happened in the event center and that this PPE, $10 million of it, was left out. In, I think from September, the last quarter of the year when there were storms from uh, September and then through the holiday season. But this wasn't the only one. There was the $2.5 million of PPE out at Seton. And really this to me uh, is uh, an, a problem of waste, taking tax dollars for granted, which never happened. These, these PPEs were um, bought with your tax dollars. So, I mean, in accidents happen, I'm not excusing this, but what I am not excusing is the lack of transparency and quite frankly, this dismissive, um, the dismissive way that the Board of Supervisors handled it, where they basically said, and this is all in the papers and in local news, well, let's figure out how to message what the actual damage is. Is it $7.7 .7 million? Because that's technically what we bought, that much, that much worth of PPE. But you know, we don't have to, we don't have to include the taxes in the shipping, even though those ta our tax dollars were spent on that. So I think what really comes to my mind is accountability and transparency, and really being careful of being stewards of your money. I mean, this is not a people. This is not. This is not. People think it's free money. This is not. This is money that you've earned and that you pay and for the, ex the services that you should expect and receive. And, that, and then, and in that expectation, you have the right to make sure that you know how your money is being spent, that it's not being wasted, and that your government is accountable to that spending. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia and Stephen. Yes, PPE scandal. I was a little disappointed, I guess, when I was hearing from Virginia as well, is um, some of the comments from, from the board. It was like, oh, well, we made a mistake. Um, and that's, that's absurd. Yes, mistakes do happen, but you can't just wipe it up under the rug and say, oh, well, we made a mistake, let's move on. We gotta make sure that we don't make that mistake again. We have to have open lines of communication. With, with the pandemic going on, and as, um, as important as, uh, PPE is to everyone, especially our first responders. There, there should have been a, a better line of communication. Once that PPE came in, there should have been a better line of communication to get it to the individuals that needed it. Um, there should be someone that's communicating with the, the board of supervisors, uh, with, with Mike Callergy, with, um, with the event center. I don't know who dropped the ball or when, but that's our taxpayers' money. $10 million is a lot of money. If it's $7 million, if it's $2.5 million, it's too much. We have to do a better job of getting those uh, uh, protective equipment to the individuals that need it and not just have it sit in a storage facility for God knows how long. Had it not been for an individual that looked through the gate and called Channel 7 News, we might not have known about it to this day and it would have still been swept under the rug, which makes me wonder 
How many other things are swept under the rug that we don't know about? So we have to be better stewards. We have to have better lines of communication. And we have to, when we order PPE, we have to get it to the individuals that need it as soon as possible. That's, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. But thank you for the question. Thank you, Stephen. And Brian? Yeah, so um, let me take a little lighter tone. So I'll be, I'll be frank with you. So it obviously is terrible what happened. And you cannot, it can't be excused. But <laughs> it doesn't I, don't like it. <laughs> I don't know. So, but, um, but candidly, we see this happen all over the country whenever there is a, whenever there is a jurisdiction that is having to deal with an, uh, with an emergency like this. We saw it in Katrina. We see it happen over and over again. And what happens is jurisdictions are not equipped to deal with situations at the emergency level of a pandemic. And so what you really need to have in place, the way that you deal with this is plan for that in advance. Have in line in advance who is responsible for what, and you have your program management in place so that you are tracking everything. Those controls were missing. Now, I am not surprised, however, that the county hasn't been fully transparent about what happened because, let's be candid, there are human resource issues of, at issue here. You cannot pillar your employees who, out in front of the public who are responsible for doing this because they are your employees. You have to go, you, you can't, by law, you can't go ahead and do that to them. And I won't do that as a supervisor. I'll tell you now, I will hold myself responsible. I will hold the administration responsible, but I will not put employees in that situation. Uh, the other thing that I'll tell you uh, candidly about this is that there's also an, probably an inspector general investigation taking place right now. So the county is going through a process where there's probably a criminal investigation taking place and they're waiting for that to clear. So I do expect there will be full, and I, and I as your supervisor, when all that was done, would expect to bring you full transparency about what happened, what checks and balances will be in place next time, and be sure that it doesn't happen again. Uh, but the, what it's really about, though, the lesson really is about what do we do program management-wise in place to prepare for the next emergency? Because there's gonna be one, whether or not it's a pandemic, whether or not it's a, a heaven forbid, it's a tsunami, whether it's an earthquake, we're gonna have them again. And we have to have our, our staff ready and prepared to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you. And we go down to Laura. Great, thank you. Um, $10 million is a, is a big ticket item. and. Um, and I recall when the pandemic broke out, uh, you know, we were in crisis as a community. And um, on the one hand, the community and the county came together in a really amazing way. Um, offices of emergency uh, services uh, were, were set up uh, right away. Uh, San Carlos was actually one of the first uh, because we had the cruise ship come into our community. Um, and we needed to house those individuals. We worked with the county to get them uh, to safety um, and proper medical care. Um, I recall when um, on the county calls that were uh, uh, proctored by Mike Callagy, uh, when they were able to procure, procure this, PPE was really, really hard to find, right? There was a shortage. Let's be clear, there was a crisis. The whole world needed masks <laughs> and hospital gowns, and everybody was fighting for it. Um, when this came into our community, it was, it was a boon. But then quickly, it was discovered that it wasn't hospital grade, right? So there was a disconnect in the very beginning about what was actually needed uh, to support um, our hospital workers. At that moment in time, in my opinion, what should have happened was to try to figure out a way to redistribute those resources into the hands of community members that needed it with proper disposition. The other thing that I think uh, failed here was um, having a clear process, a responsible county employee to take full ownership of that particular program, working with a team of people to make sure that those resources were properly cared for, stored, and more importantly, redistributed back out into communities that were, were lacking. Um, so I think continual training around emergency procedures are Im important. I work um, in uh, a corporation and we, on a regular basis, practice these um, approaches. Uh, we have proper planning and there's a playbook um, and we just need to make sure that staff is trained and when decisions are made to make these investments, that there is somebody that is, uh, everybody looks to as the leader for that particular initiative and they have the resources to manage it properly. You have my commitment that as a person experienced um, in business and managing others, uh, that uh, we will make sure that government runs efficiently and your tax dollars are used wisely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. So moving on <laughs> to coastal transportation. 
We've heard it said that uh, the most important thing with transportation is the first mile and the last mile. If you don't have public transit that helps you with those two ends, people drive their own cars. Yet here on the coast, it's very difficult and time consuming. Even though there are some buses, it's difficult and time consuming to get to uh, Daly City BART, for example, and things like that. And I think it encourages people to drive their cars, plus virtually all the tourists that come here bring their own cars. Highway 1 is a nightmare on a holiday weekend. What could we do as a county to improve coastal transportation? And I think this time we start with Stephen, is that correct? If you say so. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So yes, as many of you know, I live in, I live in Half Moon Bay, so I see uh, the traffic on 92 and Highway 1 on a regular basis, especially during Pumpkin Fest and when it's time to cut down Christmas trees. We need to have um, seamless transportation. And the first mile and the last mile is, um, is a little more difficult here out on the coast because we're somewhat isolated. But I definitely believe that we could have something to the effect of, of more shuttles, um, express shuttles, that go from points of Pacifica or points in Half Moon Bay over the hill or to Daly City. Um, and we need to work together with, with the other agencies in, in San Mateo County so that we can have that seamless transition. Um, as far as 92, there's been, there's, I'm sure all you guys are very politically astute, so you, you read the papers just like I do. And there's been individuals that talked about outside the box ideas like a, a, a gondola going over, the, over 92. <laughs> it sounds like a wonderful idea, but I don't know if that's the answer. But what I'm saying is we have to come together and think outside the box. Um, we talked about eminent domain and, and, and property rights, and we're not going to make 92 wider. That's not going to happen. Um, I don't know about Highway 1 making that wider. So we have to have something that's more feasible for everyone. Um, definitely more shuttles. If those are electric so they don't c uh, cause greenhouse gas, that would be wonderful. But we definitely need to figure out something with that first mile and that last mile, and it's definitely a challenge on the coast. But I am willing to sit down and talk to anyone and everyone about their ideas and what we can do to make better because that's what we do. We talk to each other because if we all had the idea, it would be done already. So I think seamless transition, talk to other agencies, and um, we need to have more shuttles on the coast and think outside the box and work with our constituents and our other community members. But uh, thank you for that question. Thank you. And Ray. Okay, so I'm going to out myself. I was the person who talked about gondolas. And let me explain. So, so, so backing up. So we actually, the, the coast, I believe, is our Sonoma Napa Valley. And it hasn't been supported as such. And so what I really believe what we need is we do need to have, so we need seamless, we need actually seamless transportation, as Stephen was talking about. To go ahead and get to <laughs> our economic areas uh, outside of Pacifica. Uh, but we actually need green shuttles running up and down the coast to go ahead. And we need multimodal transit running up and down the coast. But then we also need a long-term vision of what coastal transportation looks like. What are we building to over time so we can protect the environment of the coast? And candidly, I do believe that the future, especially as you're talking about the Central Coast and Half Moon Bay, a gondola that would bring you over the hill, similar to what you see in other countries, is actually something that a vision you'd want to work to. Because what that would allow you to do is it would take cars off the road, it would bring people over, and as they come down, they would go ahead and see this beautiful, majestic view of the coast. They could go ahead and enter into a green shuttle system going up and down the coast. And I think families would do that. I think people would do that long term. They do do that in other countries. And that's the very interesting thing about, uh, about transportation when you look at the United States, is we always think, oh, no, we can't do that here. We can. We just need to have the will to, to plan for it. And that's, when, and that's really where we're going to be, especially with transportation on the coast. You know, a long time ago, people probably thought that tunnel uh, wasn't going to be possible either. But we had to have the political will to do it, to fight for it. And we're going to need that in the future as, as, as population grows. One of the terrible things that's happening right now on the coast, especially on this side, uh, as for people on the other side of the tunnel, people can, uh, d during those hours of tourist hours, those peak hours, if you have a health care emergency, what are you going to do? We have to go ahead, we have to, we have to be start thinking outside the box to figure out how we're going to get those cars off the road long term. I'm willing to go ahead and do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Moving on to Laura. Thank you. 
So, um, so this is uh, interesting. I, I live in a transit-oriented community and I work in a transit-oriented community, but I can't take transit <laughs> because it's not convenient. Um, we have you know, good public transportation that runs north-south, um, both from the Caltrain, obviously, and, and buses. And the new reimagined SAM Trans um, plan, I think, is good, but I don't think it really goes far enough. Um, we need to push on that. Um, I see, with some frequency, large articulated buses running empty north to south. Um, so I think we need to invest in smaller vehicles uh, that uh, take people on the routes where they want to go, right? We're investing a lot of money in these resources to make sure they work. Um, the other thing uh, is uh, Peninsula Clean Energy has invested in an EV bike program that was sold out the first day. Electric vehicle bike sales are up, like, um, a tremendous amount and uh, they're very popular and uh, there are actually community members who've gotten rid of their cars uh, in favor of electric vehicle bike right they're lower emissions uh, they're less costly and um, I think Pacifica is is if we can build out uh, the countywide bike and master plan to make it easier for people to use different forms of transportation it can work and we've proven that in San Carlos we have seen that our bike and pedestrian activity is up significantly since we adopted and started to activate our master bike and pedestrian plan. So we need to look at how transportation is, um, is supported, and it's not just about the car. Um, in addition, um, I think we also need to call on employers to be really earnest about their transportation demand management plan. Uh, what are they doing to make sure that they're getting their employees to work in a low cost, low emission way? Um, I happen to spearhead something like this at my uh, point of work and um, uh, our participation rate is incredibly high um, and uh, we feel like we can even take it further. So I think we also need to hold employers accountable for this as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Virginia. Thank you. So for me, transportation is how does it, how do you make your life easier? How do you manage your time more efficiently? So um, we, there's a lot of talk about seamless transportation. I think that's really important from an affordability standpoint. Seamless transportation was really needed during the pandemic when essential workers were trying to come over here to work when everyone else was sheltered in place. Um, and it was very expensive for them. Seamless transportation would make it easier for people who don't live nearby because they can't afford to live nearby to be able to come to work. Um, funding needs to be available. And so I think you know, my understanding is that funding is expensive for seamless transportation. And I, as a County Board of Supervisor member, would want to help fund or at least subsidize and enhance and robust that seamless transportation um, program. The um, infrastructure costs for any kind of transportation is important as we've seen with the Harbor District. Um, with ferry transportation, I think that we have to maximize our transportation options. And even though it's not necessarily along the coast, um, I'm not sure that we're using our waterways enough. Uh, in Baltimore, where my son is, is um, getting his PhD, they have water taxis. It's a huge harbor. It's like 4,000 miles of waterway. And so how do we maximize that? Infrastructure could also mean investing in um, little simple things that really aren't that little and simple, like roundabouts. Uh, roundabouts, are they, they are uh, in El Granada and on the back streets. You know, could we do something like that on Highway 1? At least try it out. Uh, and of course, for me, whenever you do something that changes your, your, your streets or your um, roads, you have to take public safety into consideration and work collaboratively with the emergency response agency so that they can actually get to a hospital or a medical facility. Uh, that is probably the number one problem um, in, on the coast in general, limited ingress and egress, and we need to take that into consideration. Thank you, Virginia. Okay, we'll move on to a different topic, and I think this time we're going to start with Ray. Sorry about that last time. Um, IT funding is an issue, information technology funding is an issue across all layers of government. It's very easy to say, we'll start a program, fund the start of it, and then walk away from it. I think the DMV is a good example, but at the county level, what about uh, election technology? Uh, what, we, what would you do to fund and protect our, our elections from an IT perspective? 
Uh, well, I think the first thing that we need to do uh, before, so <laughs> this one, but before we go ahead, uh, we go ahead and say how we would fund it. I'd want to go ahead and know what's wrong with it. And so, what I really think you need to do is have a, a put together a, a blue ribbon commission, or actually, or, or actually ask the county grand jury to look at our elections technology here in the county, and frankly, look at how we do elections in the county and make sure it's secure. Now, we've moved obviously to mail elections, and so the question really is, how do we go ahead and count those? How do we how do we count uh, those votes? And so. Uh, what I would do actually is is go ahead put together that put together that group of experts have them go ahead and look and see where the where the weak points are and then try to figure out how you address that uh, with with the appropriate funding so thank you thank you moving on to Laura Palmer Lohan yeah thank you so San Mateo County is one of the first uh, to move to an all mail ballot uh, which will actually be mailed to you early May um, this has actually increased participation, which I think is, is great. Um, I've also taken a tour of the election facility, and um, we do need to invest in our resources. This building is antiquated, it, it's outdated. The processes, though, I do have confidence in. Um, at the same time, um, I think we always need to uh, trust but verify. So I think it's important to make sure that we get um, updates and, and reports as to um, the integrity of our elections on a continual basis, especially because we talked about before how um, so much of our uh, civil discourse is under attack. We need to make sure that um, people trust uh, that our elections processes are, are, do have that integrity. Um, I know that they also go through um, an extensive uh, ballot curing process. So if, uh, for example, a ballot comes in, then it doesn't look like it's right or the signature's off, they will actually contact that voter. So it's a highly personalized um, operation, uh, which I think is good, but also has uh, you know, potential uh, for risk. So we, we just need to make sure that we keep abreast of this and uh, lean into it and make sure that our community trusts the vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Virginia. Thank you. So IT is great until it doesn't work. Right, um, I, I think that the mail-in ballots is, is a great program, but if you want to use IT, for example, to make sure there's integrity in the process, it has to work. And um, I don't know if, if we're going to go to remote voting or whatever, but at the end of the day, if you don't have IT to make sure that there's voting uh, a ballot integri integrity, um, your ballot isn't your vote isn't going to matter. Um, I have also visited the elections office as a member of the grand jury, and it is antiquated. You should, I mean, literally, if that building caught on fire, it would be a major fire hazard because of all the papers that are in there. So there definitely needs to be upgrades in that area. But the, the integrity of the ballot, I think, is the most important. Mail-in ballots are important. But also, I don't want to do away with people who can actually walk in and cast a vote because... I've heard from seniors and uh, or even parents with young children like they're so excited to go to the ballot and you can go and drop your ballot off at the ballot box and that's great but you know it's it's I, I think that's so important to um, the process as well that's how you learn that's how parents educate their kids the importance of voting civics classes that are not being taught right now in my opinion or it's lacking um, that doesn't teach you the actual the practicalities and the process when you actually experience voting. So I think that what we're doing is okay, but the main thing is checking to make sure that your vote counts and that um, if there's anything that looks fraudulent or suspect, as Laura said, get in touch with the voter. But again, I think um, we're on the right track, but IT has to work and, and that's you know making sure that you have connectivity, for example. Uh, but voting, voter integrity is really important, no matter how you slice it, whether or not you have technology. Thank you very much, Virginia. And Stephen. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, voter IT, um, voter security is very, very important. Making sure that your vote counts, that, that you're reached, that it's heard, that's counted correctly. Um, the first thing I would do is I'd, I'd reach out to an individual that's in this room right now that's been working on this for probably like the last 20 years and talk to Brent. I figure he's, he's one of the experts. Um, we would form a, a, for, a, a advisory committee of some sort, and I would reach out to those individuals that have more knowledge about it than I do 
um, someone that I know is, uh, wants to do what's right for the community, wants to do right for the voters, and someone who I respect. So I would definitely reach out to you first and try to uh, work on that because I know you've been working on this for the last 20 years and I want to thank you for that because I think this is very important. Just like Virginia was talking about civil engagement and walking down to the ballots. That's how I started as a kid with my parents walking down to the poll booths and you know voting and watching my parents go inside and close the curtain. And um, so that's very important too. I also like the fact that we get all mail-in ballots because as uh, Laura said, it increases engagement. But we have to make sure that those votes are counted accurately and precisely and that every vote counts. So once again, I would reach out to experts in my community and work with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, for just about our last question here, I think, uh, there's been talk of splitting up PG&E Oh, did I skip somebody? No, no. Oh, no. You scared me there. Sorry. This is my first time moderating, so you have to cut me a little slot. I see a future. Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, there's been talk of splitting up PG&E, and uh, do you think that that would be an effective thing for San Mateo County? Would that make climate change easier to deal with? Uh, we have a lot of issues surrounding this, or would it just make uh, power service worse? What's your take on it? We'll start with Laura this time. Yeah, so, um, so PG um, in our community manages the grid, um, and they also manage delivery of uh, methane gas uh, to our homes and our buildings. Pen Peninsula Clean Energy delivers clean energy to your homes at a 5% discount to pg and &E prices. Um, right now, there are um, challenges uh, that are continuing around the ability for CCAs, as they're called, like Peninsula Clean Energy, uh, to continue this work. Um, there is a, a um, component of your rates from pg and &E that's called PCIA. And effectively, um, they were able to effectively negotiate uh, that this rate would be variable and, um, and, and would support uh, their infrastructure uh, for that grid. Um, and it changes and it fluctuates. Now, I don't know about you, but I think the grid has been in place for a really long time. <laughs> so why is it uh, that that price component continues to fluctuate and that you don't have a consistent bill from month to month? I spoke to an attendee here today who told me that they see their bill go up on a regular basis. PG&E needs to be held accountable for their actions. They have been around for a really long time. They need to invest in their infrastructure to keep us safe. And, um, and they need to allow um, PCE to do its work of delivering clean energy to you. We're continuing to invest in, um, in pr projects uh, that uh, build out solar with storage. So again, we can deliver that clean energy to you on a 24 hour, seven a day a week, time co-commitment basis at a reduced price uh, for PG&E. Um, ultimately, PG&E needs to be held accountable to providing uh, safe services that are reliable and heretofore, they haven't been able to do that. Um, I will continue to do my work on uh, Peninsula Clean Energy to, to make sure uh, that that conversation is in play and that, um, that the community is taken care of. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And Virginia. Thank you. So anytime you don't have competition, there are abuses. And, and I agree, PG&E is, is, is a problem. And, and, and it's actually almost like it's a government-sanctioned monopoly. But so thank goodness that you have something like a Peninsula Clean Energy, Peninsula Clean Energy or PCE, it gives you an alternative, which I think is a better alternative. But um, I think anytime you don't have competition, like with PG&E, like I said, your prices are at the whim of the company. And that's not necessarily right. They can price gouge. I mean, we're seeing that with the gas prices right now. I mean, it's a different issue. But um, the point is, is that Energy prices, just like gas prices, should not be fluctuating in the way that they are. I used to be, um, I used to do a lot of investments in sales and trading for Wall Street, and so I understand that volatility is so unpredictable, and you don't want to have that with the staples in your lives, especially energy. Um, so I do think that pg e needs to be held accountable, and I think we need more choices, and at least PC is a great alternative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Stephen. Yes, thank you for the question. So this is this is a this is a tough one 
because although we have uh, community choice aggregations such as PCE, which I'm on the Citizens Advisory Committee, and we have Marin Clean Energy, and we have JPAs that are created throughout throughout the state. But um, taking over for PG&E is would be a very difficult task because who's going to be liable? As we get our energy now from PCE, it is transmitted over the over the transmission lines that PG&E controls right now. If that was to be taken over by um, a city, a county, um, you don't you don't know what you're getting, and who, who's that liability fall on when something goes wrong? I believe PG&E needs to be held accountable. They need to stop worrying about their stakeholders and reinvest in their infrastructure. Um, they need to do vegetation management to keep their uh, transmission lines clear of branches, so that when we do have windy days, that we're not turning our power off for public safety power shutoffs, which is, in my opinion, nonsense. And why their shareholders uh, walk away with with tons and tons of money. Taking over PG&E would be a very difficult task, and would be, I think, would be astronomical as far as expenses to upgrade that system. So I don't know how we're going to do that, but um, it does need to be done. We need to we need to hold PG PG and E accountable. But I don't think it's um, it would be wise for a county to try to take over or to split them up because we don't know exactly what we're getting or what their infrastructure looks like or what's it going to cost to repair those lines or to keep those lines um, producing electricity to our, our constituents at all times. So it's a very difficult question, but it is something that needs to be addressed. So thank you for that. Thank you. And Ray. So uh, Mayor of San Jose actually a few years back actually started to look at putting together a ballot initiative actually to do this with San Jose and was trying to actually get other jurisdictions involved. But the issue that came was the liabilities that PG&E's infrastructure faces are so immense that could actually be a tremendous burden for a public, a public entity to bring that on. And so in and, and the private sector, trying to find someone to actually take that on and, and make those improvements, which are unknown, would also be really difficult. I think the, the most important thing when you're talking about PG&E, it really is from a legislative protect, uh, perspective. And I hope I don't end up in the paper tomorrow on this. But <laughs> the truth of the matter is if you really want to go ahead and start holding PG&E accountable, you have to stop allowing it to make campaign contributions. Right now in, 20, in 2021, PG&E made over $21 million in campaign contributions to state legislators. Think about that. That is an, a, state, uh, that's a, a monopoly created by the government that then turns around and gives the government, uh, government elected officials money to run for office. That's not a level playing, playing field for taxpayers. And that has to be changed because what we saw happen after the, after the fires, where so many people died in paradise, was you saw the state, you saw the state actually then pass legislation to go ahead and, and make PGM uh, immune past a certain settlement of liability. We have to change that. And then we have to change that before public trust in the system. Because it may be that that was the right thing to do. But with that level, with that playing field, the way it's set up, it's so hard for us all to really know and understand. And so what, we, we have to change that. And that's something that I'm talking to our state legislators about. And then what we have to do is after we do that, then we know when they hold hearings and we're looking at the actual infrastructure that needs to be met. And PG&E says, look, we have a real problem here because climate change because let's face it, climate change right now, what's happened with climate change, is it's exposed infrastructure to risks that they didn't have before. And that's a liability that PG&E didn't put into their long-term planning. And so some of the, what they're telling us is true. But, we'll, but we have to have a level playing field and be able to assess that with our state legislature. And taxpayers have to be able to trust that going forward so that they're willing to go ahead and work with the utilities to make investment long-term. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I appreciate all your answers to these questions. It's time now to segue to our finale. We each will get two minutes to wind up with what you'd like us to remember about what you're going to do for San Mateo County and for Pacifica. And let's uh, start uh, this time at Virginia, I think, is her turn. I'm assuming these are our closing statements. Mary, closing there a statements. In there? Yes, yes. No, no <laughs> questions, just your closing statement. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having us here. Uh, government and our elected representatives should be working for all of us, everyone, all the people. Our elected representatives should reflect our diversity in this county, both racial and diversity of thought. Having the privilege of serving on two elected offices boards that cover this, a significant part of our district, District 3, I understand the diverse needs 
of doing things like supporting a local ec supporting local economic development that so that revenues can flow into your city working to balance the necessity that local economies and local economic development uh, with environmental protection ensuring that children get the after school resources and support that they need from for important organizations like the Boys and Girls Club of Pacifica, and getting down to the fundamentals of government representing you instead of interests, special interests like developers that pick profits over neighbors. During a time of uncertainty, when inflation is at a 40-year high and gas prices are high, the, and necessities are high in terms of prices, there is no room for politics. And you deserve someone who will represent you and um, will be a leader who is courage, who is courageous, and who has a proven leadership track record. I'm very proud of our grassroots endorsement, or grassroots support and endorsements of workers I've, um, people I've worked with, like my firefighters, Harbor Patrol crews, uh, workers and community leaders. And I humbly ask for you to support me and vote for me and join them as well. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you. And Stephen Booker, your final statement. Yes, um, so thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's a very interesting process. As many of you know, I'm not a politician. Um, I was approached by a young man when I was sitting up here and he asked me if I was a candidate and I was like, yes. He said, you don't look like a candidate. I was like, what does a candidate look like? <laughs> So I say that because I'm not a politician. I'm a first face with new ideas. And I think representation matters. And one of the things that we have is a co-sider that lives on the coast that would be here every day. They wouldn't have, to have, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have to open an office on the coast, which things like this are hard for me to say because, like I said, I call them colleagues earlier, friends, whatever. We all get along. I like Ray. I like Laura. I like Virginia. We have very good relationships. We talk often, have lunch together, so on and so forth. Um, but my ideas are a little different. I would already be on the coast, but I wouldn't want to open an office on the coast because I think that would be a burden to taxpayers. Um, but what I would do is would facilitate meetings with city councils in different cities or community centers where I could be there on a Friday or a Thursday once a week or once a month, and that would, you would still have your supervisor over the hill and here. Um, so I just want to say that we can and must do a better job with our affordable housing, with our veterans, for essential workers and our teachers, we must ensure that every child has internet access in an ever-connected world. And I just want to let you guys know that I'm a lifelong San Mateo County resident who probably lives in Half Moon Bay. I'm a United States Air Force Gulf War vet, and today my job is standing up for workers' rights. My unique background gives me a well-rounded experience throughout our diverse county and the ability to represent all the people of the 3rd Supervisorial District. Um, I look forward to earning your vote, and if you guys want to know any more about me, you can look at my uh, website, bookerforsupervisor.org. Um, thank you for the time. Um, thank you to my opponents for uh, sitting up here with me again, and I'll see you guys, I'll see you guys on Thursday. <laughs> Thanks very much. And Ray Mueller. Thank you. So first thing, I just want to congratulate uh, my colleagues up here. It's a, it's, it's a long time talking. And it's a lot of work, and I think we're all probably really tired, but you guys, everyone did great. And it's a pleasure, to, it's an honor to be up here with you. Um, you know, I am gonna talk to the fact about that, and I've talked about it, about building a relationship with the community. And I, and I respectfully, and I, we're friends, but we do disagree on this, about opening an office. I'll tell you why. When my family, when I was growing up, and uh, my family needed help, I didn't know the supervisor. My, know the supervisor and if they were going to go ahead and have a conversation with the supervisor they didn't have time to go an hour away to meet that supervisor and probably wouldn't have gotten the appointment and so what you real what the idea of having that office is to be play take a is to build a relationship with the community and have a place where people can walk in when they have a problem and talk to you they know that they can come in and yell at me they can tell me i am desperate i need help and staffing that. And then it's, there's also just people who need to go ahead and say, look, I have a problem getting through county planning. We're going to have grant writers there to help nonprofits. We're going to have planners come in. We're going to go ahead and create a situation where the coast doesn't feel like it's so removed from Redwood City. 
and it does feel removed now, and it's about the people who I don't know, not the people who I do. Uh, I, I really appreciate your time. We didn't even get a chance to talk about farm workers today. We have a whole, we have a, a massive farm worker issue with respect to housing, with respect to their access to health care. I'm proud in this, uh, in this race to be endorsed by uh, Dr. Belinda Ariaga, uh, who, who is a, a farm worker advocate from Victoria Sanchez de Alba, who's here in, uh, in Pacifica doing that work. Uh, I, it, I'm happy to talk with all of you about that afterwards. We didn't get a chance really to talk about how to create affordable housing. I'd love to have a conversation with you all about that. We want to talk about how we're going to expand health care to the coast, because we have to do that. The coast is too cut off from health care. And my time is up. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And we come to Laura Palmer Lohan. Thank you again. Thank you to Pacifica Democrats for hosting this conversation today. I really appreciate the opportunity to learn more about what matters to your community, our community, my community. Um, I am a working mom, a small business owner, a city council member. Um, former mayor of, of, that, of my city, and um, uh, I agree, relationships matter, and I am so proud uh, to have the endorsement of every single one of my colleagues on city council. Uh, we've been through thick and thin together during the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we've accomplished uh, navigating our community through that, um, as well as other big initiatives in, uh, of the work that still needed to get done, um, and they've all lined up uh, behind my uh, candidacy. Um, and they uh, recognize my work and how important it is to me to make sure we focus on areas of alignment and, and, um, and work together to um, identify our, our shared goals. To that end, I know how to solicit input, identify needs, and build and implement those plans that provide measurable results for you. You have my commitment that I will continue to do this work. I understand the priorities and concerns of the community. I've been on an extensive listening tour. That listening will never end. In fact, my phone number is 650-743-0059. That comes directly to me, and I will take your call any time of day and night unless I'm sleeping. And then noti <laughs> notifications are on. But uh, I'll return your call in the morning. Um, I'm a skilled manager of people, and I'm uh, currently chief of staff for an organization of seven, 600 people that de deliver medicine, life-saving medicines uh, to our family members. Um, I'm a consensus builder who readily initiates and nurtures relationships of value, mutual respect, and trust. I'm a member of the LGBTQ community, so I know what it means to be left out, marginalized, excluded. Therefore, inclusion, welcoming, creating a welcoming community and belonging where people have agency and a voice in the community that they want to be a part of is core and central to me. Um, I. Um, I have the support of the current seat holder, Don Horsley, who has worked tirelessly for you, who's mentoring me, whose ear I have, um, and, um, and uh, Rich Gordon, Ted Lempert, his two predecessors. Um, in addition, Carol Groom, um, as well as hundreds of community members. This is a grassroots campaign, and the good news is the voters get to decide. The voters get to decide. I want to earn your vote. I want you to join Team Laura. I want you to volunteer, <laughs> donate, canvas with me. Let's get the word out. Let's work together to build the community that's sustainable and one that um, has clean air, clean water, uh, a seawall, <laughs> uh, no flooding, and homes that people can live in and, um, and, and pass on to the next generation. Thank you so much for your time today. I so appreciate all of you. So I just want to say thanks to all our panelists, and again, just to run through the names to be sure that everybody knows, Laura Palmer Lohan at the end there, Virginia Chang Karali in the center, Stephen Booker also in the center, and Ray Mueller. Thank you all so much.